Hey guys, Infidel1258 here. Today I'm going to do some frequently asked questions. Instead of going live though, today I'm just going to get into the chat because I haven't, sorry, the, the comments because I haven't gone through those in a while. Uh, I am doing my best day to day with my phone, but you know, almost 6,000 subscribers, it, it gets away from me. So let's get into it today. We'll spend about an hour here um, reading comments, answering questions, whatever it is you guys are leaving in the, in that, um, on the channel, we're going to try and get to some of that right now. And if you're new to the channel, we do this sort of thing once, twice a week, and we always talk about Splinter Lens because it's changed my life and I think it could change yours. If you're interested in that sort of uh, in-depth kind of deep dive on what Splinter Lens offers and what the community are interested in uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, then you might like the channel. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you subscribe, like, and subscribe. Okay, let's get into it. King Arminius three minutes ago said, Oh, a photo of my, yeah, that, that's a photo of the members. I do personalized messages and like photos, family stuff, like personal comments, shorter videos, long, sometimes longer videos that are about just whatever's on my mind. Um, and today I posted a, a photo of my kiddos, my two daughters snuggling together and just having a great time. And it's amazing because Lumina, my youngest, we, we were told the day that we met her, she'd die. And so... She's five years old. She's going to be six in January. She's amazing. Her and her big sister just have a, this very special bond. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, doctors don't know everything, guys. That's the that's the thing here. So look at these two cuties. They're happy and they're smiling and they're snuggling. So let's see what King Arminius had to say. Uh, he says, this photo makes my... No, that's my comment. Let's see. Comments. We'll get it. Okay, King Ar King Arminia said, "Crazy resemblance with you. Truly, your daughters. Cute to see sisters lovingly cuddle with each other. Family is the most important thing, and you have a beautiful one. Thanks, man. You are very kind. Yeah, I feel very lucked. I, lucky. I feel very blessed. These kiddos are a gift, and um, and uh, even Lumina with her special needs, she's exactly what she's supposed to be, and um." You know, none of us knows how long we're here for, do we? But, um, but hopefully we can have a smile on our face while we're here. Matthew Young says, amazing family you have. Thank you, sir. I absolutely agree. Justin Webb says about the bargain hunting video this morning. He said, what is the best way to convert SPS in game to DC? Thanks. Merry Christmas. Hmm. Isn't it? Can't you just go like, let me see. So I'm going to claim my SPS and I'm going to see if there's an easy way here. I think there is. So I know that you can use liquidity pools and apparently that's really easy. I've never done that before, but if you, if you want to look at, um, pancake swap or what's the other one, there's another one. Um, there are ways to do that very easily. I don't, I've never done that. You'd have to YouTube that like pancake swap SPS. Um, but that I'm sure there's content on that. In fact, I know, I, I'm certain there would be. But let's see, we got 350 SPS. Now let's try and... No, I don't think we can do that. If it's helpful, you can. I know you can take your SPS. Listen to this, this is not what you asked. You asked, how can I get my SPS to DC? I have a solution for you. It's not easy, but I have a solution. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you one alternative in case what you really need is you just want in-game credits like because you want to buy things you come click on the plus sign and you buy however many let's say you want a hundred dollars worth of let's say you want one dollar worth of credits you go here and click on crypto and then you can use splinter shards and you're going to be able to tr the game will transfer your splinter shards uh for in-game credits so that's one way that you might be able to access if what you're trying to do is buy cards or packs for that matter uh, but I think you probably just want DC for the purpose of airport airdrop points. You didn't specify, so I don't really know. But let's say you you really need DC for some reason. You take your D, your SPS and you come in here and you go transfer. And you go. You need to have. You need to know your whole hive. Uh, you need not. Ju you can't just do this with a Splinterlands account. You need to set up your hive and link it, and you need to know your passwords and all that. But let's say you've done that. You take your SPS and you transfer it to Hive Engine. And you transfer out. I'll do it easy enough. There's no fees associated with it. So I'll go. Yeah, so that takes about five seconds. And then we're going to go over to hive engine in a moment when it's done thinking. 
So it's gone from here. We'll go over to Hive Engine, hit refresh, and we should it should pop up in my wallet. Not yet. Winter shards, there it is. 345, that's what I sent, worth about $82. And then what you need to do is you come in here and you do a trade. And you're going to trade it for Hive because you cannot trade it directly for DAC. So trade SPS at whatever the market price is. And these are the sell orders. These are the buy orders. So I, you would just click on, look, I need to sell 300. So I'd, I'd click on this price because that's he, he's asking for enough. He has enough buy volume that he can cover my order. So I click on his price. It auto populates. I click on this balance. That auto populates. That Hive is what I'm going to get. And I click on sell. And then I'm going to say yes. Yeah, I'm not actually gonna do it, but then you click yes, sell, and then it's gonna it's gonna process. And because of the way I priced it, it's gonna fill right away. If you wanted to be set your own price in here, you could do that 1.6. You know, that's like a little bit lower than this guy, a little bit higher than this guy, and then you just have to wait until it fills. That's the first step. And then once you got, once you actually had your hive, you could go over to the DEC window. Now we're in the DEC window, and you would do a buy order. Or whatever based on the sell price this guy's selling forty nine thousand. so you go ahead and put, click his price and you'd whatever if you had if you had 60 hive at that time oops let's say you had you wanted uh let's say ten thousand ten thousand dc that would cost me 37 hive you'd just click buy and the same thing that's it and then you once you got your dc in your wallet the wallet the the dc would appear into your hive engine wallet i have some No, I don't. Thought I had some. A wallet. No, I don't have any DC. But in your wallet, if you had DC here, it would be DC. It would show you the, the amount that you had, and you would click on this little arrow. Actually, no, that's not true. Forget this last step. You don't. You, once you have the DC in your wallet, you would come back to Hive Engine, I mean to Splinterlands, and you would go into your DC window, and you say, However much you just bought, say 10,000 from Hive Engine. And this time we're saying transfer in because we don't want to transfer it to Hive Engine. We want to transfer it into the game. And you would click transfer in and it would, I don't have any, but you'd, you'd approve the transaction and, and it would happen. Within, you, the whole thing would take maybe two minutes. So the, and there is no fees doing that because um, you're not with, withdrawing Hive from the marketplace. If you're withdrawing Hive, there's a 1% fee on all deposits and withdrawals. Um, but there's not a 1% fee on DC withdrawals. No, there's not. So, nor, nor SPS. It's really just Hive. So when you extract Hive. Uh, okay, so that's the, the way I always do it. I know there's other there's liquidity pools you can utilize. And as far as I understand, they pay similar fees um as like you, know, you might expect it's like one percent or half a percent or something so those are not free what i just described to you would be free but you'd have to you'd have to set up your hive engine um with your in-game name um which is easily done and if you need a video on that i already did a video on that a while back i think it was called like increase your security and convenience with hive or something like okay so let's get the next question Oh, let's see how this went. This before we go on. DNA raffle turning me had 52 entrants last night. What did we finish? 68, not bad. So 68 is not a full. Um, we have a half an hour. Yeah, you're not going to get this video before before it runs out of time. But we're close, guys. Uh, at 12 o'clock today, this will begin and it's 500 DC to get in. And these people are going to have a one in, there's only 70 of them. There's going to be, there's seven re rewards. They've got really good chance of winning these raffles, which is pretty awesome. Like they're paying $2 and 50 cents to buy a ticket to win a, an amazing summoner. So keep an eye out. I'm going to do these videos, these tournaments once a week, TNA raffle tournament three will pop up tomorrow and it'll be ab about a week out. I'm going to set it. I, I want to try and find that kind of, I want to max out at a hundred every time. Um, so I'm going to set the next one to 400 DC, but I might reel in the rewards a little bit, So we'll see. Uh, but check that out. Okay. Get the next question.
Use hive engine. Okay. Adam Wallace is blessed. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord, my dude. God is good. Jose Corolla, Carrillo, Car I think it's probably pronounced Carrillo, if I'm not mistaken. The double L is usually like a Y sound. Thoughts on selling gold? KS summoners I got in packs, then reinvesting for, for more collection power than the summoner gives me. I love this idea. What he's saying is he got a gold chaos summoner in some of his packs. And so he's like, that's great. It's worth quite a bit of money. What if I sell it and then reinvest that value? What could I do with that? Hang on a second, guys. Okay. So summoners, not gold foil. So I don't know which one he got, but let's say he got one of the Tarsa. It's worth 50 bucks. Wow, that's really that seems really cheap. That seems really, really cheap. What's the power on this thing? So it's 500 power for 50 bucks. Is that? So it's ten bucks per hundred collection power. It's not. It's not a good deal from a collection power perspective, but it's a good deal from like a from a just a card perspective. Like a a level one is going to equate to a level two. A level one gold is going to equate to a level two in game, and that's going to be very competitive in you know bronze for sure, and even silver. Like you're going to be accessing level three commons, two rare, two epic, and one legendary. That's a silver. That's like the best you could use in, in bronze or, you know, it's going to be a helpful summoner in silver. But for $40, right? Like, I think it's a bit cheaper than I just paid for this. No, it's a, it's only a couple dollars more than I just paid for the one I'm giving away later today. Because I bought regular foil copy of Tarsa. I bought level two version of it and it was like 37 dollars. this is for a few more dollars you more you're going to get that gold which is more collection power anyways that's not your question yeah i definitely think you know it makes a lot of sense for a person who has a very limited deck to sell some of the cards that they maybe aren't fully going to utilize like you the question do you have a gold deck probably not you know you have one gold card and it happens to have a high value so Yes, you could use it without having a gold deck. That's okay. And yes, it gives you certain benefits like extra DC per win. The question is, do those trivial or minimal benefits outweigh the potential for the, the reinvestment of say 50 bucks or 80 bucks or 60 bucks? I'm not sure which one, it, which summoner you have, but let's say you had, you know, obsidian for 60 bucks. I'd probably, you know, I'd, if I had, you know, 5,000 power, collection power, I would probably do exactly what you said and sell a $60 card and then take that and go ahead and reinvest it. Because again, this is 500 power. One of these is 500 power. Let's say you had a budget of, let's say you had a budget of $58. And can, the question is, can you beat 500 collection power? Absolutely you can. Just go over to buy and go over here to compare over here to collection power to cost ratio make sure you're on regular look they're 93 roughly 93 collection power to a dollar so if you got 58 dollars out of the deal times even let's be conservative let's let's say even 80 58 times 80 you could you could turn that 500 collection power into probably almost 5,000 collection power if you're sitting in bronze right now that's a no-brainer you know what I mean? Like that's an opportunity to move your deck up to the next level so you can start incurring better and better rewards for your time and attention. That's one of the most important things you can do in this game. Does it mean that the card you have is bad? No. Does it mean it's a bad hold? No. It's an excellent card. You probably, sh you know, it'd be great if you could keep it. But this is an opportunity that maybe might uniquely benefit you and your story better than holding that gold foil summoner. Now, if you're in a different boat and you already have like, let's say a gold or a diamond league account and 
5,000 power is not really going to move the needle for you, um, then that's perhaps a different story. The question then is, you know, what, what utility does the gold foil summoner have for you? Are you, is it a level one? And if so, you're probably never going to play it, right? If you're theoretically a gold deck, you're not going to play a level one Tarsa. So what utility does, does it have to you? And the answer is probably none, right? Other than the fact that it's a cool investment. It's a cool card that you're hoping that one day you'll be able to sell for more. And I think confidently you will be able to sell for more. But if this goes up 10x and you're not using it and it's only giving you 500 power, wouldn't it have made better sense to liquidate it for the 40 or 50 or 60 bucks, depending on which summoner it is, and reinvest that into other power, even if it's literally just the cheapest, crappiest cards that are out there. You know, Pelicor Bandit, six cents for five collection power. Um, you know, that's, it's dirt cheap. And you could get, well, you could get, I think a hundred of those, is that right? A thousand. If we had an obsidian and we sold it for 58 and we divided by 0 0.06, you get a thousand copies of a Pelicor Bandit or, you know, 200 copies of the Bandit, 200 copies of the Conjurer, 200 copies of the Gargoyle Lion. In most, in most cases for beginners, this sort of approach that you're describing and that I'm unpacking is going to benefit you more because it's going to give you more cards to work with at a higher level with more power. That's going to give you more SPS airdrops. Um, and I guess the other alternative would really be to sell it and put it into DC and then sit on those airdrops. But if you watch my channel, you know that that's not what I recommend because DC is so widely flux, you know, volatile. And, uh, and so I think these cards are going to be worth, you know, way, way, way more, maybe 50 cents, maybe 10 X, maybe hundred X in the future. And if you saw the video recently where I featured the, um, gelatinous cube, that thing cost me a penny and now it's selling for like $3. So, you know. The opportunity for price appreciation on these cards to me shouldn't be passed, shouldn't be overlooked, but it is being overlooked. Most people are waiting for Chaos, Chaos Legion packs, they're scrimping and saving every penny because they want more packs. That's awesome. But these opportunities in front of you are going to be cheap power, are going to bring you into silver, into gold, into higher levels with more rewards. And uh, they're going to unlock more airdrop points for you as compared to just holding that one ledger, that one gold foil summoner. That's my deep answer, my long answer on that one. I hope that was helpful and informative. And I'll move on now. Thanks, Jose. Adam says he likes how I caps the tournaments at 100 people. I agree, man. Yeah, it's nice because if theoretically, if 100 people slammed the tournament and just crush, you know, took all the seats, I could just fire another one up. I don't need to wait for the full seven or eight days and, and see if we get maximum number of entrants. That's point number one. Point number two is, yeah, it reduces the um, the opportunity or it increases the opportunity for every individual to walk away with a card. And this time around, I'm going to try and aim that all the cards that I'm giving away are at least three dollars, the cost of admittance. And therefore, it's like 10, 10 opportunities to get your money back. Plus, a couple of them are going to be really nice. That's what I'll do. The Mike Knight says, you have not opened the packs for the maximum SPS gain. Think bigger picture. Hmm. What are you talking about there? You have not opened the packs for maximum. In the video he's commenting on. Collection power driven D's. I just recorded this last night, but I didn't get enough sleep last night. So I, my brain isn't working. What is he talking about? This was a bargain hunt video with some gold grind elements where I specifically explored the marketplace to see what was the cheapest cards and, and the rats, the exploding rats last night were the, the cheapest CP. So I bought 25 or 30 of those, but I also bought um, 50 copies of some other cheap card and a few epic monsters and maybe a couple legend. I bought some dark, some heart claws also. You have not opened the packs for Maximus gain. I, I think he's talking about, I don't know how that relates, but I think he's talking about chaos Legion packs and how I didn't open my chaos Legion packs, but of course I did. 
Um, I'm sorry, Mike. I really don't know what you're talking about, dude. And if you're talking about opening Chaos Legion packs, I did open my Chaos Legion packs. And what's more, to maximize your SPS gain, you're actually likely losing SPS when you open your packs because a pack gives you 300 airdrop points, but when you open it on average, you're getting like 118 uh, airdrop points. That's math that, that Peak Jarvie provided a while back. So I'm just trusting his math. I don't, he's better at that stuff than I am. Um, and if you don't follow his channel, you should Peak Jarvie. He's the one who created Peak Monsters. So if I'm understanding you correctly, the answer is no, you will get less SPS once you open your packs, but you will get more utility because you can use the cards. Okay. Mr. Rockaholic says no more bargain hunting for me in the next time in the next time. Yesterday I maxed out my Silver League life deck for 350. Oh, nice. And today my Earth deck for 470. Wow. I'm so happy. Death is almost finished. Next goals are water and fire. Was waiting for this opportunity for about a year. When land comes out, I could even go faster. Greetings, Rockaholic. Nice. Well done, sir. So he, this is one of the things that I definitely strongly advocate for. If you think Splinterlands is a meaningful game and a meaningful opportunity um, over the long over a long enough time horizon, right? Not, not, I'm not talking in the next couple days or weeks. If you see this game for what it is, um, then I, I think your approach should mimic Rockaholics, which is to set goals for yourself, whatever level you're at, whether you're bronze three and you want to move to bronze two, or if you're, you know, uh, gold and you want to move to, to champion, set goals, understand your weaknesses, explore your deck and see how you can increase um, your win rate uh, and your your reward for your time and attention by selectively choosing certain cards that are going to really dramatically improve your power. Focusing first on summoners, second on tanks. Uh, equally, maybe second, tie for second is carry cards, tank, cards that are not necessarily a tank, but that by themselves can be can win you the game. Sometimes that is a tank, so that's why I say tied for second. And then third, support monsters. Um, and and those are, that's that's how I look at it. Summoners, tanks, uh, carry cards, support monsters, and you're building out your deck, moving ever closer to what you would consider, you know, ideal. And for you, that might be silver level one. For me, it might be champion level one. It doesn't really matter what the where the where you're aiming, so long as you're setting a goal and you're aiming. As side note, I love Jordan Peterson talks about the idea of aim. Uh, he talks about the, the idea of sin. And this is, he talks about how sin the, actually means to miss the mark, which is like an archery term. You you shot the arrow and you missed. And so you, there's a way that you're supposed to, and you didn't. There's a, there's a way that you're, you're, you, you're aiming at. Um, and that is accuracy and that's perfection and that's success and that's victory. Um, but you, but you miss and that's thin. I love that. First of all, I love that. Second of all, um, it actually, it, it, when you start to think about, um, life in that context, there's a way to live it. There's a way to win it. And this game also, it's like you, you need to have goals. That's the point. You need to be measuring your progress uh, on every level, personal, professional, every level, so that you can constantly be checking in with yourself, not for my review, not for someone else's approval, for your own analysis and, you know, uh, iteration, because sometimes you're going to try and set a goal. It's going to be inadequate. It's going to be inappropriate. Um, it's going to be either too big or too small. Um, and that's going to be a failure in some sense then you're going to iterate on that goal and you're going to you're going to come back at it another time and hopefully you're going to see greater and greater growth on whatever dimension that we're talking whether that's physical health whether it's investment and in your you know portfolio growth or whether it's literally your splinterlands monster deck um so i love that rockaholic you're setting goals and you're you know moving toward it and you're and you're being patient you said it's been about a year so good for you aha uh -huh. El Rondur says, with modern format, the cards you buy now don't 
Hard to buy now don't will be useless when the rotation will out if you are a new player and can't will can't play in the wild format. Hmm. There's some spelling there, so let's let's try and understand this. Buy the past cards grow in value, but with the new system, I don't see how this card can have more value. Thanks for your time and Okay. So you're saying I think you're saying don't bother buying the modern cards because they won't price appreciate. And I think that's absolutely incorrect. And I say it, you know, firmly, but hopefully you're hearing, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I want to address your question, uh, with accuracy and with logic. Um, cause you say the past cards grow in value, but the new with the new system, I don't see how this card can have the more value, more value. Thanks for your time and attention. More value. What do you mean more value? Do you mean like that they won't appreciate like modern cards such as the um, exploding rats will fail to appreciate? Absolutely 100% incorrect, my friend. Period. That's not a that's not a debate. That's a, just an objective, you know, fact. Why do I say that? Why am I so confident? Why am I being, you know, um, unwavering about that? The even the exploding rats has a limited number of cards. There is never going to be more exploding rats. Um, over to fire. It's a board card. The exploding rats. Right there. There are 146,000 cards circulating of the regular foil. Yeah, people are burning them. This is always funny when people burn cards. There's 1,300 in the market. Now, I do believe, if I recall correctly, this is only a fraction of those that are... Let's see. How can I check this? Oh, yeah. Cute kids. Exploding rats. Okay. So, there's going to be 316,000 copies. And only 16% and only of them have been released. Okay. There's going to be 300. Now, I think that means there's 300,000 that have been released, but there's only, but there, but there's going to be more. I might, I might be misreading that. It doesn't really matter. The point is there is a limited number. It's not infinite. They are already at 16%. And when this thing goes to hundred, it'll no longer be issued in the loot chest that you, that you, we receive it in now. That's going to mean a dramatic lack of supply. It will, there might be, it might be the case that by that point on peak monsters, there is an ample supply of exploding rats. Right now there's 1300. Uh, maybe by the time we get to this thing being listed, uh, removed from the reward system, perhaps there'll be 10,000 here. That sounds like a big number, but there, you need 115 copies to make a max copy. And most people want more than one. They want at least, I would say 40 to get the redemption. Um, and there's 400,000 accounts in this game. And, and I think one day there'll be 4 million accounts in this game. So there's just not enough exploding rats. Period. And these cards are always being compressed into higher and higher BCX. So it's just not true that, that these cards won't see price appreciation. They already have, in fact. Like when some of these cards came out. Well, maybe these ones haven't. But some of these cards already have. Well, I can't remember where the numbers were before, but I mean, there absolutely is a, it's just a matter of supply and demand and there's not an infinite supply and there is a growing demand. And that's why I strongly believe that even cards like exploding rats will one day be worth way more. And if you doubt that, I guess maybe you'd you either perhaps doubt then that the fact the game will keep growing, which I believe, or maybe you just don't understand like that that how it's always worked because you know the it's the formula is simple. There's a finite amount. In fact, there's a shrinking amount, and there's a growing demand. That's that's all you need to know, and as a result. They absolutely will appreciate so long as, hear me now, 
so long as the game keeps being played and keeps uh, growing in its user base. And my view is this game is awesome and more people will come to it. If you disagree with that point, that's fair. You can, you're allowed to, and that makes, you know, that's a point. That's not a fact. That's, that's my opinion, that part. But the, the deflationary nature of these cards is a fact. And to me, that alone disproves the suggestion that cards like this won't one day appreciate. But I also add my opinion, which is that the game will continue growing. And that opinion would imply further and further price appreciation. Okay. I hope that's helpful. And let's see, Yuki says, more cards with bad status like Poison, Stun, Debuff will make Harklaw more powerful relatively. That's true. That's true. Because I was saying, what would make Harklaw more powerful in the video? Because he's he's super nerfed. Like, I'm not nerfed. He's super underwhelming. And people, you know, look at him. He's on the, he's the cheapest legendary card in the game at 750. And so what what could happen with, the, with Rift Watchers or with the legendary summoners that are going to come out through the airdrops on Chaos Legion, what could happen that would make this card more playable? To Yuki's point, if there was a bunch of new enemies that had poison, that had stun, that had, you know, negative status effects, um, affliction, and so on, that would make a card like Harklaw even more resilient because he's resisting those negative status uh, effects. That's a great point, Yuki. You're, you're absolutely right. So watch out. The point in the video was understand when a card is is really underwhelming that splinterlands recognizes that fact and they are considering at all times how could they tweak things previously with uh crypto Lo or with um with lamacron you saw everyone playing it and then they they've they've now released some counters to that including death blow and Giant Killer. Those are two new abilities that were almost intentionally, I would think almost explicitly designed to speak, to be response to Lamacron. And that sort of thing could happen again in the future. And in fact, will almost certainly happen again as they continue to evolve the game and try and, you know, lift up assets that are ignored because they do. They all, they've, they're thinking about that stuff. They're, they're thinking about what's too powerful, what's not powerful enough. And what can we do to kind of bring it into into play? More more cards with bad. Oh yeah, yeah, he's got you. Hmm. He points out the lowest mana with those abilities, Giant Killer and Death Blow, is the Jin Apprentice. It's a, yeah, and that's a very strong card. You guys should check that one out. Luchataro says, Harklaw is a really good card, but I think the only reason why people don't use it is because of the speed. In, in just one to two rounds, Harklaw is dead. In fact, the death, death deck only has one heal and you can only get it by maxing out Pegasus. So rather than using Harklaw, might else use Tank Neutral instead of Haunted Spirit or Windaku for self-heal. Yeah, I think this is a strong point. There's lack of healing. You know, I suspect there will be new monsters that will bring healing to the death team because your point is is well taken. You're right. There is a lack of healing on that team, especially now that Pegasus is, you know, it's an older card. It's only in the wild format. It's not going to be in the modern. Um, and so I think there probably will be a new tank healer coming. Jerome Gonzalez says, uh, nice. I was wondering how, how Reflect would work against Recharge. This is good info. Yeah, in the video, we, we learned that a recharge monster, which triples its damage, will only reflect half of its base damage. So in the video, a monster with two magic fired at me on a reach with a recharge ability. That hit it hit me for six, but it only reflected back one magic damage towards the recharge uh, attacker. So that's really, really important because it, it means that the recharge monster is not going to just nuke himself. Um, I thought he was just going to nuke himself when he magic reflected it off of me, but you know, he didn't. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Uh, Zachary says, what if one of the legendary summoner airdrops was a dragon that gave 
pre-charge, all charge monsters would get 3x damage on the first attack. Oh, that would be wild. You know, there's not so many recharge monsters um, that that might... Like, I could see that being possible. But I would think that that would be very powerful. Because you play it under the right context with enough of the... You know, even two or three of the rechargers. Um, did you say... If it was a dragon summoner, you can imagine... Legendary Summoner airdrops was a dragon. Yeah. If it was a dragon, then you would be you would be opening the door to like um Divax Bool, E Fruit Rising. So I'm saying you could do Dragon and another Splinter. You're gonna get at least two rechargers. And imagine at the highest levels, this guy hitting for three times three is nine. Um with death blow. Oh, death blow would be irrelevant because that's and then this guy hitting three by three is nine with how could you how would you how would you i'm trying to imagine ways to gimmick that really because you have to whenever you think of a new summoner like that you always have to explore how could it be gimmicked to really make it broken i would think even two let's go over here i would think if you even had two that did You even had two monsters that did it. That'd be it. Look at this. You could have, you could have three, one, two, three, because he's neutral. Uh, oh, half your team could do death. So you, you see how powerful that would be, especially at the highest levels, because this would have a three magic, which turns into nine. This would have three archery, which turns into nine. This would have, I think, two magic, which turns into six. Or conversely, if you had black you could go these three instead of ifrit um i get the feeling they wouldn't do that maybe they could do it where it was it activated once that would be interesting if it was like battery you know the the, the ability was like battery and it allows one of your um recharge summoners to get that to fire on the first round that would be alone very powerful so i get the feeling that would be an interesting suggestion that plays on the same idea you're presenting there good idea though zachary fun i like thinking that stuff through you know because that's that's the that's that's the coolness of splinter lands can you imagine like agro niyaba or whoever is developing these things is sitting around a table having conversations like that they love the game they're talking about this new monster. They're like, hey, what what if we did this? And then they, they spend some time together just like batting it around like, you know, we do right now in videos like this. And just like you would with your friends if you were, you know, out for a beer talking about your favorite hockey team or your favorite video game, like talking about this strategy versus that. <clears throat> it's awesome. <coughs> okay, my throat's starting to act up. So I'm going to do five more and then I'm going to wrap early. Valentine said... Just FYI, you can sort by status, example, speed for reverse speed battles. I know you can. So, Valentine, I know you can. Um, I don't remember the context of why you're saying that there, but the way Splinterlands operates, I'm going to show you guys quickly. It's really buggy sometimes. Let's fight a battle because I want to show in the window, you absolutely can go and click on a certain ability. Is that what you said right there? Am I, am I misunderstanding? You can sort by stats, yes. Example, speed for reverse. Can you sort by speed? I don't think that's true. Is that true? Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh my goodness. Mana cost, rarity, armor. Oh. Valentine, I didn't know this, dude. I did not know this. This is this is game changing. The speed up. Wow. So let's We are forever learning one step at a time. As long as the world Mm -hmm. 
I'm distracted by actually trying to win. Okay. So I, I had no idea. That's really helpful, Valentine. Did you guys see what I did there? That's Valentine's tip. You actually can use the sorting window, which I've never used. I thought he was talking about the ability window, which is um, you can type in whatever ability. I find that's a very buggy window, and I don't like using it. Let's watch this match, and then I'll watch... Oh, one, but not mean to skip. Oh, well. That's okay. Let's focus on the questions. Let's do four more. Thank you, Valentine. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay, let's see if there's a big one here. I'm gonna scroll. Okay, Adam W says, "Thanks D12. Obviously, the the airdrop collection points you get from the new from the raw DC is greater than the burn rate of the cards you purchased, but that doesn't factor in the rental potential that you could earn the ga that gap back, which I have never taken into consideration for. Great point, dude. Yeah, this was." This was a super helpful video for me. Maximizing the SPS airdrops is my number one focus right now, but some of these deals really are too good to ignore. Okay, so in the video, we talked about how there are times where you can buy like cheap collection power. Collection power is getting cheaper and cheaper. Like I showed you earlier in the video, it gets, it's down to like 93. Um, go buy air S. We're at 93. That's a very, very cheap collection power per dollar. That's very cheap. Now, if you were to spend a dollar on DC, I think it goes like this 0 0.0053. No. One divided by 0 0.0053. So you'd get 188 DC right now. Is that right? 5.3. Yeah. So if you took a US dollar and you bought DC, you get 180, call it 180, because there's going to be some wiggle on the price. You get 180 DC. That's going to be 180 airdrop points. If you went and spent a dollar on those cards I just showed you, you're going to get 93 collection power. That's only 93 points, so it's literally half. It's half as productive for the SPS airdrop to buy cards, even the cheapest cards, as it is to just buy DC. So on the one hand, that that proves everyone who holds DC is brilliant. They're doing the right thing. Just keep holding DC. It's giving you tons of SPS. But here's the thing. I said a couple of points, I think. First, SP DC has dropped from like 1.6 cents per DC down to, you know, 0 0.00, like a half a penny in what, a month? That's got to be heartbreaking for most people. And so I would say that that alone is a cautionary tale for why holding DEC is dangerous. But in in um, my point, that wasn't my main point. My main point was that once you... So if, if you're worried about the loss of value that can come from holding DEC, what you might consider is, sure, these cards are less effective at, at creating airdrop points for you, but they are giving you an asset that is... Um, quite likely to appreciate with a, over a long enough time horizon is playable, right? So it can help you in your, in your rank battle and help you climb into higher leagues, help you earn more rewards for your daily, you know, investment of time and attention. And even if you don't play it, even if you don't use it, it's going to, it's, it's a potential rentable asset, which is going to drive some amount of DC into your wallet every day also. And so it isn't exactly just buy cards or hold DC. It's it, the buy cards option has a lot of versatility built into it. And I would argue a lot more security because cards are almost certainly like much more likely to appreciate over the next four years than DEC. I'll say that again. I really strongly believe that one day DEC will reach um, its, its peg value of a thousand to one dollar. And that would be heartbreaking to be holding DEC from this point till that point. That would be a huge additional loss. But in the meantime, over the next two, three, four years, these cards like Exploding Rats are going to be going up in price because of all the reasons I laid out earlier in that conversation um, with the, the comment about, you know, deflationary nature and, um, and whatnot. Okay, so yeah, thank you for the comment, Adam. True. 
get one more big one. Okay. Okay, so we got two kind of compete. It looks like we might have competing conversation here. So let's look at this. This was a video I did where I was talking about the question was like, what can, should we be worried about the game's ability to retain new players and to excite new players and to, you know, invite new players? Is this game, you know, becoming too focused on the older players was kind of the question. And I said in the video, I said lots of things. It's a 12 minute video, but I said, among other things, I said, look, the guys who are playing the game today are getting way more rewards than I ever got. The DEC is higher. DEC is worth more. The cards are worth five to 20 cents. I used to get cards that were worth half a penny. So the, 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 plus the risk profile of this game today versus what it was three years ago is so different. When I was playing this game and there was a thousand people playing, there was a great likelihood that the game would just disappear. Now with 400,000 people playing, there's a very small likelihood that it'll disappear. And therefore the risk profile for you people getting involved today is totally different. And so it should be less profitable now. That's, that's an important point that you need to understand. It shouldn't be as profitable as it used to be because there was a totally different risk profile. People like me who were putting thousands of dollars into a game that might disappear overnight um, took more risk than you are today. But also the daily rewards are higher today than they used to be. So that that kind of goes against the narrative that, you know, new people are really suffering with this game. And I said all that in the video and I said the focus, stop focusing on like the three week turnaround or the three month turnaround and start focusing on the three year time horizon. And you're going to see that you're going to see those rewards. And it looks like Taylor's got an opinion in, uh, and maybe uh, Pew Splosion has a different opinion. So let's read them both. Taylor says, I don't understand the mindset of complaining about a game that has brought insane returns on investment to its players. Just be patient and if everything goes according to the plan, you and everyone else participating in the game today will 3x to 5x whatever money that's put in. If not more in a few, if not more in a few years time, don't matter how much you have or put in, getting the type of return vastly beats 8% annual returns with the S&P 500. This is a totally true, Taylor. Like, you know, traditional markets are so ridiculous. You know, the, they don't even keep up with inflation, but I, I don't want to get, get caught in a digression here. I totally agree, Taylor. The problem is new players are under the illusion that they don't have to contribute anything to get an insane return. So many have, a, have drunk the NFT Kool-Aid and see projects for little reason, um, and see projects that for little reason have produced six figure NFTs. That's not Splinterlands. Got to build the economy and sustain it. Now, I do strongly agree that Splinterlands is different in its approach to growth. And it's clear to me that some other projects, and I'm not going to name names, but it seems to me certain projects have, have given away, what's that expression? They've given away the cow with the, you know, like they've, they've, they, they burn out fast because of how they design. So yeah, they might've had a ton of players and maybe a lot of early excitement, but now they're kind of unimpressive, underwhelming. No one's talking about them. Why? Because they weren't building for the long run. They weren't iterating on what they had created. They weren't expanding the utility and the fun and the opportunity. It was like they stuck with what they, they had originally done and People got over it. Splinterlands, we got so much growth around brawls, around the division of leagues, around the new packs every year, around land coming in, what that's going to be. So much going on. I think I, your, your point is well taken, Taylor. I, I'm in strong agreement with what you're saying here. Let's see what Pew Splosion says. The problem, in my opinion, that the devs and the vets seem to be missing is that there is zero focus on new player retention. Yeah, I disagree. Let's go on though. I've been saying this for months. I really like the game and I'm okay with lots of things that they try to do in order to hold value into loyalty and investment. Okay, that's good. Um, but you also have to capitalize on growth and give new players a reason to stay. This sentence to me seems disconnected from the rest. Like, but you have to capitalize on growth. Okay, yeah, I, you do have to capitalize on growth and give new players a reason to stay. This part loses me. 
you're getting, like I just said, the cards you're receiving by playing the game are probably between 10 and 40 times more expensive than the cards I used to get for playing the game. So that should be a reason to stay. The DC you're getting per win is probably five to 500 times more than I was getting when I used to play because of the, the, the algorithmic inflation around DC. The DC itself is worth, um, it's worth half a penny. The one DC is supposed to be a thousand DC. So each DC is supposed to be one dollar times times point zero zero five three. So one hundred DC equals fifty cents, but it's supposed to be one thousand DC equals one dollar. So it's literally five. Is that five times? So if I went like this, and yeah, it's five times the intended value. So, and that's at the, that's at the current price, which is hugely reduced from the 1.6 cents per DC, which I currently, which I showed you a moment ago. So what does that have to do with it? You're, I, you said that, you said that, um, what did I lose, I lose you, lost you. They need to give pl new players a reason to say it. The cards are five to 40 times more expensive that you're earning, the reward cards. The DC is at least five to 10 times more plentiful that you're getting paid for playing. The DC is worth five times what it was when I was getting, when I was getting paid with DC. That right there to me are three amazing reasons that you are receiving amazing rewards for playing this game. So, and I don't, let's see if you give me any sort of refutation on that. Let's see if there's any pushback or any logical kind of, you know, challenge to what I just said there. The reason old players assets are 10 xing is because of the massive growth creating demand. The hundreds of thousands of players that are joining can leave the game just as fast if they have no reason to stay. They do have reason to stay. That's, you haven't, you haven't established that they have no reason to stay. You just, you've said it twice, but you haven't given any justification for it. The assets are going to just fall back to where they were once the demand it will be gone. Yeah, that's that's a theory. Um, you, you haven't given any justification for it though. Another issue with with the game, in my opinion, is how many players that that are actually staying, uh, that are staying, are really playing rather than only investing. Most of the people of those people joining then quitting because there's no attention no attention to of non new players and i disagree you haven't you haven't proven that point are the actual gamers so you're saying there's a lot of people sticking around but they're not putting a ton of money in so that's fine that's totally fine you know that happens with time it doesn't need to like as an old player hear me i don't care if this is a rocket ship to the moon or if it takes for you know 10 years like i'm enjoying the game and so i don't need my cards to appreciate wildly for me to enjoy what I'm doing. If you do, if you feel that you need the economic incentive to enjoy the game, then you actually don't enjoy the game. And that's important to be honest about. I'm not trying to slag. I'm saying that's important to be honest about because it actually speaks to what you're hoping to get out of this. If you're, if you're willing to play the game, or minimal or trivial reward, understanding that those trivial rewards could be worth meaningful amounts of money in the future, that's the sort of attention, sorry, the sort of attitude that's going to, um, gonna, gonna, gonna serve you well and actually gonna uh, enable you to play this for the next three, four years when we enter that bear market and when prices do decline. And that'll be the attitude that will lead you to be the next big whale. But if you come at it from the perspective of today during a bull run, because this is still a bull run, if you come at it the attitude that you know these investments or sorry these returns are too trivial for you, then it's not going to be tr it's not going to this game just isn't for you because you're for some reason really fixated on how much you can get out of it financially in the short run, um, and that's not what this game has never offered that to anybody to no one, and that's not what it's about. So I'm like I'm being quite forceful with this point because. I just actually want to help you and anyone who has this opinion, um, shares this opinion, that this is not the game that's going to try and make you rich in three weeks or even three months. 
It's not even really aiming at making you rich, but it so happens if you happen to play it and give it your time and attention for a long enough time horizon that these assets that are trivial in value because of their deflationary nature will appreciate wildly on a long enough time horizon. And that might be four years. If that to you feels like you point earlier saying things like, you know, there is no reason to stay or that there is zero focus on new players. Well, you're getting tons of rewards. I just pointed you to three different rewards you're receiving. I never got, but you don't acknowledge that as being meaningful. And so you, you clearly have an opinion that those are inadequate. If that's inadequate, then, then the, you know, the game's optional. No one makes anyone stay. So I would say that that's probably, I would, I would challenge you to wrap your head around my points here because I would encourage you that if you if you actually understand what this game is, then you're going to be one of the people that benefit in the long in the next three, four years. But the attitude I kind of I'm reading here and again, not trying to be um, um, aggressive or hurtful, just trying to actually provide a counterpoint so that you can think about it from another person's perspective on that one. Um, I think you're going to be you're going to even if you play it today with this type of attitude in two, three months, you won't. And then you, that's when the, that's when the, uh, the riches are going to be earned though, by the way. So this is my, my point is <clears throat> if you can write your, your, uh, attitude about what these rewards are, understanding that they are delayed, their pr true appreciation, their true value will be delayed then you're going to get yourself in a position where through the next bear market, you're going to crush it, accumulating those assets when no one else wants to, and then see that amazing price appreciation. But if even these rewards today are inadequate to you and, and, and to, by your definition equate to zero focus or no reason to stay, which are your words, then that would imply that the bear market is absolutely, you know, you, you're totally out of here. You're totally gone. And so, People with this opinion should definitely not put any money into the game because you're gonna, you're gonna, you're just not gonna get that true. Um, you don't see where this is going, and that's why I'm speaking so clearly around. I'm trying to articulate where it's going and how you can the value proposition here because I don't think you have understood it to this point. And again, apologies if this sounds harsh. Just like the video tough love for new players i'm my, my my goal is actually to help people with your opinion to try and see what this could be because i don't think you do i'm going to keep going though i'm going to see maybe there's more here that you are going to help me understand your position better okay um let's see so they quit when they realize they can't even experience the game beyond the starter cards well again you can you can on it takes It'll take years to put together a deck with no startup capital. So if you, the implication of this sentence is that you expect a free, a quality starter deck for free. That's what the implication of this is. Um, why would the game start you off with cards beyond the starter deck? It shouldn't, it won't. That would be a bad idea. So if you want cards beyond the starter cards, you have to buy them. And that's been crystal clear from day one, all the way from the tippy top aggro saying things, um, you know, it's not free to play, play to earn. Even if it is kind of fun. Okay. I mean, you like it, I guess that's good. Meanwhile, those, those that are staying are investing mostly, maybe playing some, maybe not. But dumping a few grand into DC and pulling in a daily airdrops is about as good as any investment opportunity that exists. What will happen when the airdrop ends? A lot of players that have start, stayed around sell out because they, they were only investors, not really players. I think that's a fair point. I think there will be people, especially in the bear market. And I've said this on my channel many times. The bear market's going to come. And when it comes, people like yourself will leave. And you, people like yourself will leave comments on my channel saying this game is dead. You, even maybe not you, but people uh, are going to say Bitcoin is dead and they're going to say Hive is dead and they're going to say crypto is dead. And I'm going to ignore that entirely because I think it's nonsense. And I'm going to ignore, ignore the fact that there will be a, 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 a dip in viewership, a dip in players. I'm going to ignore that all 
and I'm going to just continue to enjoy a game that I like playing. And I'm going to accumulate assets that I know for a fact are deflationary in nature. And I'm going to receive them for free through nothing but my time and attention. And then I'm going to uh, accumulate those until the next bull run. And then people like yourself who feel that uh, there's opportunity in bull runs only are going to come back. And you're right. There'll be, it won't be 400,000 people. It'll be 4 million or 10 million people playing the game. And the prices will go crazy for the reasons you're actually pointing to. Um, but that's why you need to prepare now. And it, I don't mean by going out and buying all these cards and because you're making it sound, I think you're conflating two things. You're saying that people are investing a ton of money, um, on speculation, but that's, that will be lost. That's one point. But then you're saying that people will leave the game and that's a totally different point. There's different, there's different people, right? So I think I don't care if, if most people leave, even if most people leave, if I bet there'll be at least 50,000 daily active players during the worst part of the bear market. That's my prediction, 50,000. And I'll be one of them. And that will be 50 times the number of daily active accounts that used to play when I started playing this game. That is a sizable growth, even if it is a gigantic step backward from where we're at right now. My account, my card account will go from like where 170 were at its peak to, you know, maybe it'll drop down to 25 or 30. But I again put in five grand to seven grand for these cards, you know, years ago. So a five X on that value to me would be fine. I don't care about the short term and it's, but I, I, I keep feeling you pulling back to the short term. You keep saying things like there's no reward. There's n it's, there's no focus on the new players. You mean over the last three months, I totally disagree for all the reasons I outlined, including those three, like your daily rewards, the card values, the DC value, all of that to me is a direct uh, counter to your whole point, but setting that aside, if you just change your time horizon to four years out instead of four months out, your whole argument falls apart. Um, and I want you to hear that with love because it actually is a life changing opportunity in front of you. And you're kind of saying, no, thanks. Like you the attitude seems to be, seems to be, if you were here, I'd love to hear you. You as I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm, I'm trying to understand you sincerely, but it seems to be not good enough for me. I want some, some indication or some value today. Otherwise, no thanks. And that's your, that's your choice, of course. But I honestly think you're going to regret that. And that's why I speak to you in this way and take what probably 15, 20 minutes now to talk about this, because I want you to hear what I think you're missing. Let's finish it out. Let's see. I've seen a lot of numbers thrown around about player base million plus spell books, about half a million daily active players usually pointed out that a huge portion are bots. Uh, one thing I looked at is how many people really play at the top leagues. There are only about 2000 to 4,000 players trying to compete in the gold and champion outside of those people. I'd say there are a huge chance that remaining players fall into a few categories, investors only likely to quit after the airdrop ends, new players likely to quit when they realize they need a ton of money to rank up or bots. Okay. Anyway, that's a lot of rambling. It's also negative and I'm sorry for that. Okay. appreciate you saying that. I hope you hear what I'm saying. And, and, and even though I've been pushing back, I hope you hear that it really is intended to have a meaningful conversation with somebody who has a counterpoint to me, not as a point of hate or frustration or anger. Um, I'd love to see your comment on this video and see what you say about that. So it's also new. Despite all that, I have a high hopes for this game and I've invested my life. Wow. There you go. He's invested his life savings. If I, if that tells you anything about what I think of the actual game, there's still plenty of time for improvements to retention of the new features that can, and hopefully will come along. Yes. I want to, I want to extend an olive branch because you say here, there's still plenty of time for improvements to, to retention or for new features that can, and will come along. This is an important point that I'm willing to concede. This game needs more growth. 
there is more there are more dimensions to where this game will reach including land including the new wild versus modern format those are two examples but there will be many many more examples that will come based on my trust with these developers and so to me that raises the question will those be executed well will the economy break when land comes out and when um they introduce items and spells those are going to be almost necessary to compete at a high level will they break the economy in the sense that if you don't have land you won't get items and spells if you don't get items and spells it's play to win i'm not saying it will happen that way but i am saying to you as an olive branch i see that there are opportunities one to improve this game and that they will keep seeking them and two to break this game and I trust that Splinterlands developer team will see those hurdles and avoid them. But that's my trust. That's a degree of faith. I'm play. It's not logical. Well, it's partially logical. It's based on their prior performance. But I do not have a way to hold to in front of you and say, look, it's certain this game will continue to grow in a in, and improve. I can't say that. I just believe it. And I hear you saying your whole your whole uh, paragraph or your whole conversation really is you have a heart to see them execute that improvement process well and that you want um, them to do it optimally and that you you vision you envision ways that they could execute uh, really great improvements, but you also fear about falling too far away from incentivizing new players. I wonder what you have to say. I want to close with this. I wonder what you have to say to the fact that I said to what I said here. There you new players who start today are receiving monster cards that are about six cents up to, you know, these are just the commons. Let's go reward six cents up to buck 50 buck 50 gold yeah you could get gold two dollars see Are any of these the new ones arc law you could get 200 dollar gold foil today playing the game okay Oceanus 225. So there are there are opportunities in every loot chest that are dramatically more valuable than, than I ever received playing this game three years ago. That's from the cards price perspective. First point. What do you say about that? Second, the DEC is worth five times what it used to be. Five times. What what do you say about the fact that every DEC you earn with every rank battle you win is worth five times what it used to be when I was getting it? And lastly, um, what do you say to the fact that because of the algorithmic inflation around DC and how the DC is disconnected from its intended peg value, the game prints more of it, meaning that you get for this battle, I got, I think it was the results. I got 31 DC for that victory at gold level one or two or something. I didn't used to get this sort of DC. It was much, much lower. That's due to algorithmic inflation. That's be because of how the system works and because it's it's giving um, it's giving out more to try and bring the price down. So for the last three to four months, this has been so. Ever since the SPS air airdrop began, DC has spiked in price. The amount of DC being printed has have rap grown rapidly ever since July. So all new players have enjoyed those three benefits that I never had. And yes, um, I think that that means absolutely there's a wild justification for new players to stick around. But that's the short term, and I don't like talking short term. Long term, there is a home run in front of you. There is an absolute life changing opportunity with this thing. And and I think in four years, these cards will be there will be another bull run. And the, all of the excitement you're seeing now around SPS and around coming to the game will grow again. There will be a new surgence of that, resurgence of that. And so that's four different points, three that are short-term and one that's long-term. And I wonder what you would have to say about that because I think 
to articulate the real position of a new player, you need to fully respond to those four things. Um, and if if we engage in those topics very, I think, thoughtfully, we, we walk away from the conversation understanding that a win is dependent upon your time horizon. If you need something to happen for you with your portfolio in the next three months, this isn't the game. If you want something to happen with your portfolio in the next four years, I think have fun with this game. Think of it as fun first and rewarding second, as entertainment first and opportunity second. And then you're going to you're gonna be one of the people like me who are going to really benefit. Um, that's I feel strongly about that. I appreciate you leaving that detailed comment. And I hope you hear this in the um, vein as intended, which is constructive and um, and uh, you know thoughtful feedback. Um, I, I enjoy this sort of dialogue, this sort of give and take between people who disagree because frankly, argument's not a dirty word. In today's day and age, we often we often run away from argument and argument is like two people hate each other. I don't hate you. I'm glad you left that comment. I appreciate your 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 investment in this channel and to spend time sharing your your view. I hope you see that that's what I'm trying to offer back to you in this moment. And for everybody else, I hope you saw value and benefit from this conversation between opposing opinions on this game and uh, the value proposition that it offers. Guys, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks for your time and attention. Have an amazing day. God bless.